On the 23rd of June 1999, at 10 o'clock in the morning in the province of Anhui, police sirens blasted across the city of Hefei. The police were responding to a call from a woman claiming there was an armed man in her home who had kidnapped and was holding her husband captive. The man was demanding money from her at gunpoint in her small apartment. Close to 200 armed officers rushed to the scene. They arrived at the small residential building in a built-up area of the city. They secured the area around the building, clearing out any people wanting to watch the excitement, not leaving anywhere for the armed man to run to. The police cautiously made their way upstairs to the room, unsure what threats from inside the room they would be facing. The apartment at that time was a dormitory for an industrial installation company. The woman who made the call to the police had already left the apartment. She had told the armed man she needed to go out and collect the money for what was effectively her husband's ransom. With the tenant of the room already safely out, and no other people in danger inside the room police approached the door to start trying to convince the man to come out of the room peacefully. As the police stood in the doorway of the room to speak to him the armed man tried to hide himself behind a suitcase in a corner of the room. They tried to convince him to come out with them telling him to lay down his arms and surrender. The police that life was too precious to waste in this way. The man responded, What is precious? That tiny salary you take. After around two hours, officers felt that the man would not leave the room peacefully and made the choice to arrest him with force. Two gas canisters were fired into the room before police stormed inside. The man resisted, fighting back to try and escape. In the melee shots were fired and the suspect was hit in the leg. The fight left the armed man and police carried him out of the room. The man in custody was Fa Ziying. Police took him to a hospital, where doctors treated his gunshot wound and the broken femur he suffered from the bullet. Fa Ziying wasn't given any time to recuperate. As soon as it was possible the police questioned him wanting to know the location of the man he was holding captive, Boss Yi. Fa Ziying would lie or change his story several times while being interrogated, the police feeling he was stalling or playing with them. He first told them Boss Yin was still alive in the room Fa Ziying was holding him. Then he claimed an accomplice had taken the hostage to Henan, a province over 500 kilometers away. He would ramble about nothing, lie about where he came from. The investigating officers quickly realized they were not going to get anything from Fa Ziying. If they were going to find Boss Yin alive, they were going to have to do it the hard way. And so they started a massive search across the city. Five days after the arrest of Fa Ziying, on July 28, residents of the Shuanggang community, situated next to Hongqiao Primary School, complained to the building's landlord about a foul odor coming from one of the rooms. On opening the door and entering the room, the landlord was greeted by the horrific sight of a decomposing body locked in a dog cage. The landlord immediately called the police. As soon as the call came in, they knew the body would be identified as the missing Bao Xi. Arriving in the apartment and finding the body stuffed in a cage that didn't leave enough room for the victim to sit up, police began to search the rest of the apartment looking for more evidence. They didn't have to look too hard, they would find a fake ID for Fa Ziying, along with another ID card for an as yet unknown woman. It appeared the woman had also left a note for Fa Ziying. The note said, Dear, I will go first. I will be waiting for you at home. I love you. The charges Fa Ziying was now facing had already gone from kidnapping to the much more serious intentional homicide, and they were going to get worse. In a freezer, police were shocked to find the decapitated body of a second male victim. Fa Ziying was lying on an operating table getting further treatment for the injury to his leg. Given how serious the situation had become, investigators were not going to wait for him to recover. They had one victim to identify and an unknown possible accomplice who was on the run. They started their interrogation while he was still lying on the operating table. Now knowing the two bodies had been found, Fa Ziying would tell police he was the one who killed them. He would further confess that he had also killed several more people in various provinces over the past few years. Thinking they had also arrested his female accomplice he tried to put all the blame on himself and gave his accomplice's name as Lao Rongzhi. When police asked him the whereabouts of Lao Rongzhi, Fa Ziying realized she had not been caught. He just smiled and would say nothing more about her. It would take 20 years for her to be found and face punishment for the crimes that she had been involved in. Jiangxi province is located in the southwest of China on the south banks of the Yangtze River. It is perhaps best known in China for its porcelain, rushan tea and the oranges that grow in the region's subtropical climate. 
It is also the home province of both Fa Ziying and Lao Rongzhi. The two were born and raised in the city of Jiujiang, located in the north of the province. Given its location on the Yangtze River Basin, Jiujiang has long been one of the most important ports along the river. However, the lives of Fa Ziying and Lao Rongzhi could not have been more different before they met. Born in 1974, Lao Rongzhi was the youngest of five siblings. She had two older sisters and two older brothers. Her father worked for the Jiujiang Petroleum Company, and the family lived in a company dormitory. By all accounts, she did well at school and had a desire to go on to study at university. On the advice of one of her brothers, she would choose instead to attend a vocational school to learn teaching. Her brother felt that teaching was a good and noble profession that she would be well suited to. So rather than going on to high school and facing the college entrance exam, she entered the vocational school after graduating from middle school. By the age of 19, she had finished her training and was given a job at a primary school that was in the grounds of the company her father worked for. Born in 1964, Fa Ziying was the polar opposite of Lao Rongzhi. While she was a solid student and a popular person on the company compound, Fa Ziying hated school and gained a reputation as a fighter, along with the gang of kids he hung out with. By the age of 17, he was convicted of robbery and sentenced to eight years in prison. When he was released, he would have found it hard to find a job because of his criminal record, but he had no desire to look for work. Instead, he went straight back into criminal activity, forming a small gang and running illegal gambling dens. He quickly gained a reputation in the city and earned the nickname Fa Lao Qi or Pharaoh Seven because he had six siblings. Because of his criminal activity and growing underworld reputation, his family, who were just honest, hardworking people, would distance themselves from him. Their relationship slowly broke down over time. Fa Ziying married a local girl and had a daughter with her, despite his negative reputation around the city. In 1993, at the wedding dinner of a mutual friend, a 19-year-old Lao Rongzhi met Fa Ziying for the first time. He was 10 years her senior, and she was aware of his reputation, even being familiar with his Pharaoh Seven nickname. Despite being so different, the two hit it off, and that night Fa Ziying took Lao Rongzhi out for a ride on his motorbike and began a relationship. The two quickly fell in love. Fa Ziying left his wife and daughter to be with Lao Rongzhi. At the time, Lao Rongzhi was earning 300 RMB a month, about 40 US dollars today, as a teacher. The salary was quite good for the time, but Fa Ziying was earning thousands through his gambling dens. Fa Ziying spent lavishly on her, buying her gifts, taking her on trips around the province. Going for nights out on a regular basis, Lao Rongzhi became accustomed to this lifestyle. Teaching was a tiring job with long hours for relatively small reward. So after just one year working as a teacher, Lao Rongzhi quit her job to the surprise of her colleagues and family. At this time, Fa Ziying got into a dispute with other local gangsters over a gambling debt. He stabbed the person with a harpoon and decided to leave the province and head to Shenzhen in Guangdong, as new regulations were being introduced at the time. People needed to apply with the police for a permit to enter Shenzhen. Fa Ziying got one for himself and Lao Rongzhi. Shenzhen today is a spectacular mega city and the home of the Chinese tech industry. It has grown from a tiny fishing village 40 years ago to the modern city of over 17 million people today. In the early 1980s, Shenzhen was chosen to be the first special economic zone in China and was an important part of the reforms of China and its opening up. Shenzhen was chosen to be an experimental ground for market capitalism mixed with Chinese socialism. This saw a number of private companies basing themselves in the coastal city. The factories and industries need workers, and so migrants from all over the country would flood into the region for work. The two weren't interested in doing long hours of physical labor, and the lifestyle they had become accustomed to in Jiujiang wasn't going to be covered by the meager salaries on offer. Fa Ziying resumed his criminal activities while Lao Rongzhi took up bar work. They stayed in Shenzhen until 1996, but decided to leave after Fa Ziying robbed someone at knife point outside a bank. Fearing the police would come looking for them, they left Shenzhen and traveled to other areas before deciding to return to Jiangxi, settling on heading to the provincial capital of Nanchang City. After moving to Nanchang, the two rented a nice apartment in the city while they cooked up more plans to make money. Fa Ziying felt his usual methods held too much risk of attracting the attention of the police, and the rewards were too small. In his mind, a crime was a crime. The size of it didn't matter much if the consequences were the same. So he felt that had to look to get bigger rewards faster. What they settled on is often referred to in China as 仙人跳 
Xin Ren Tiao can be translated into English in several different ways, but it is perhaps the term the immortal dance that is the best of the translations. The term Xin Ren Tiao, or immortal dance, was penned by the Ming Dynasty poet Ying Meng Chu in 1632. In the poem, the phrase is used to describe the act of people using a woman's beauty to seduce a man as so to trap someone into a blackmail scheme. It would be this technique that Fa Ziying and Lao Rongzhi planned to use to make money. First, they needed to find a more suitable location to carry out their plans. Fa Ziying believed their current residence had too many people around who could be potential witnesses to what they planned to do. He wanted to find an older, more run-down apartment complex with a landlord who didn't pay much attention to maintenance of the building. They quickly found a place they thought would be perfect for them in Xishang Yuting community. Lao Rongzhi rented the room with an ID card she had stolen from one of her former colleagues from the bar work she did in Shenzhen. She then would become a regular at a bar in the area known for being the type of establishment where wealthy single and married men went looking for some company. It didn't take long for Lao Rongzhi to find a target for her to perform the immortal dance. We will refer to the man she locked onto as Bao Xiong as that how he is identified in many of the reports about the case. Bao Xiong wasn't a man to hide his success or wealth. His gold and diamond jewelry and the Rolex watch on his wrist made him an obvious target for Lao Rongzhi. He was the manager of an air conditioner company and ran a small hotel in the city. He was also married with one child. Once she had shown her target to Fa Zin, he would tell the man to his home to see if the wealth he displayed was for real or just for show. He determined that Bao Xiong was indeed rich and gave the okay to Lao Rongzhi to ensnare him. Over the following weeks, Lao Rongzhi got to know Bao Xiong in the bar and he would take her out for meals, even introduce her to some of his friends. They would go on shopping trips together with Bao Xiong using his personal driver to transport them around the city. Eventually, the time came for Fa Ziying and Lao Rongzhi to put their plan into action. Lao Rongzhi asked Bao Xiong to come to her apartment under the guise of helping her with an issue with the air conditioning in the apartment. Bao Xiong jumped at the chance, but on entering the room he realized instantly the mistake he had made. Before he could react to what was happening, Bao Xiong had a knife put to his throat by Fa Ziying. Fa Ziying asked the man which he would rather keep, his money or his life. Lao Rongzhi bound the arms and legs of her admirer and the two relieved him of anything worth money. This was not enough for the couple. They felt they would be able to get more. Fa Ziying wanted to go to the home of their hostage, so his wife could go to the bank and get money for them to release him. Lao Rongzhi felt the plan was risky, so the two left Bao Xiong alone for a moment while they privately discussed how they would do this. While alone in the room, Bao Xiong heard footsteps in the hallway outside. He shouted for help and desperately fought to get free of his shackles. Fa Ziying burst into the room and attacked the terrified hostage. He put a wire around the neck of Bao Xiong and pulled it tight. There was a struggle but eventually, Bao Xiong stopped breathing. Fa Ziying quickly began the process of dismembering the body of Bao Xiong. He put some of the parts into a bag and the couple left to carry out the second half of their plan. When they arrived at the home of Bao Xiong, Lao Rongzhi went up first to check if anyone was at home. As she knocked on the door she was seen by a neighbor who asked who she was. Lao Rongzhi didn't even have to think up a reply as the neighbor rhetorically asked if she was the occupant's sister. Lao Rongzhi said she was and the neighbor happily accepted the response. The criminal couple waited until around 11 p.m. before going into the room. Using the keys of Bao Xiong they entered and found his wife sleeping. Fa Ziying woke her by emptying the bag that contained the remains of her husband onto the bed. Shocked, confused, panicked and scared, it would take a moment for the woman to recognize a birthmark on one of the hands. Fa Ziying held a knife to the terrified woman's throat. He told her that her husband had assaulted Lao Rongzhi, so he had taken revenge and now she would have to compensate them, or she would go the same way as her husband. Fa Ziying tied the woman up as Lao Rongzhi searched the home. She would take anything she could find that had value. When put together their total haul from the robbery amounted to over 30,000 RMB, over 4,000 US dollars in today's money. Unfortunately, the ordeal the wife of Bao Xiong was going through didn't end. Fa Ziying decided he didn't want to leave any witnesses that would be able to identify them. And so he took care of the woman and her three-year-old daughter. Before they left, Lao Rongzhi suggested setting a fire in the apartment to get rid of any fingerprints or other evidence they left behind. Fa Ziying said no. He felt it would only attract attention faster. The two left the building and would soon leave Nanchang. The father of Bao Xiong had been growing increasingly concerned that he hadn't had any contact from his son in a number of days. 
Bao Xiong couldn't be reached at work and his home phone line was dead. His father and brother went to the home to see what the problem was. When they got to the door of the apartment the worry grew as a key was in the door to the room. Inside they saw the devastation left by Fa Ziying and Lao Rongzhi and tried to call the police. The phone in that room and the neighbor's phone were not working. It was later discovered that the phone lines had been cut by Fa Ziying. They had to go downstairs to the building manager to contact the authorities. The police quickly started investigating the ransacked room. The bodies of the wife of Bo Xiong and his daughter were in the bathroom and up to that point, there was no sign of Bo Xiong himself. But before police could consider him a suspect, they found the remains Fa Ziying had brought with him to the scene. Now they were looking for a third victim. The police found the last person to see Bo Xiong alive, his driver Xiao Li. Xiao Li told police the last time he had seen his employer alive was when he drove him to a mall to meet a woman. He didn't know the woman's name but had driven her a number of times and knew she worked at the Golden Dragon Dance Hall. He gave police a description, which the police made a sketch of. Xiao Li also told police that Bo Xiong went to the nightclub with his friend, we will refer to as Bo Xiang. Police showed Bo Xiang the sketch and he immediately recognized her as Chen Jia, a girl from Sichuan. Bo Xiang added that he had previously driven Chen Jia back to her home a couple of times and gave police the address. Police showed the sketch of the woman to people at the community and she was easily recognized by other tenants. The landlord of the building took them to the apartment and opened the door for them. As soon as the door opened the police and landlord were hit with the smell of decomposition. The police had to make a long 1500 km journey to Sichuan after staff at the Golden Dragon Dance Hall said they had not seen or heard from Chen Jia in a number of days. In Sichuan they quickly located the real Chen Jia and it was apparent that this was not the woman that had rented the room in Nanchang. Chen Jia informed police she had been working in Shenzhen for a time and her ID card had been stolen. She was sure she knew who had taken it but couldn't give the police a name. Most of the girls working in the bars only used fake names. The police returned to Jiangxi dejected. The lead was a dead end, Chen Jia was unable to give them anything. She told police the woman spoke very standard Mandarin so there was no accent to identify where she was from. They started to re-interview people who knew the woman to see if they could get any clues to her real identity. Thanks to Boss Zhang, it would be a traditional dish that would give away the identities of Lao Rongzhi and Fa Ziying. Food is an important part of Chinese culture. The various regions have their own speciality dishes and traditional methods of preparing them. Whether it be the spicy, woolly hot pots of Sichuan or the infamous chou dofu, Otherwise known as stinky tofu of Hunan, the food someone likes can tell you a lot about where they come from in the country. When police went back to boss Zhang and continued to interview him about the woman he knew as Chen Jia, he would remember a time when they went out to eat with Bao Xiong. Bao Zhang recalled that the woman claiming to be from Sichuan ordered a dish known as Hu Kou Jiu Zao Yu. This can be roughly translated as mouth of the lake fish in white and is a traditional dish from Jiujiang, and at that time wouldn't have been widely known outside the city. Bo Zhang had commented on her choice at the time, curious as to how someone from Sichuan knew about it. Chen Jia giggled and said she had tried it before and thought it was delicious. It wasn't much to go on, but it was at least more than they already had. The police focused their search on Jiujiang City. They put the clue Bo Zhang had given them with the information that the real Chen Jia had her ID card stolen in Shenzhen. They looked for two people from Jiujiang who had applied for a permit to enter Shenzhen. Within days they had two names. Lao Rongzhi and Fa Ziying. The police went to their homes and the homes of their families in Jiujiang. The couple had been there but departed just days earlier. Fa Ziying had left the box with his sister. When police opened the box they found items that belonged to the victims in Nanchang City. The police issued an arrest warrant and circulated photos of the fugitive couple. They had missed them by days after working so hard to find them, now they would be starting the search over. In the months after leaving Jiujiang the couple traveled around various cities in China, living off the proceeds made from their crimes in Nanchang. They had seen the arrest warrant issued for them and the wanted posters the police had disseminated. But they were starting to get low on funds so they moved to Wenzhou City in Zhejiang province. Lao Rongzhi took a job in a hotel, working as a hostess in the hotel's KTV bar. The hotel also gave her living accommodation as part of the job's package. At that time in many cities in China, in some hotels it was required by law for men and women to show a marriage certificate in order to share a room. Police often visited the hotels to check who the guests were, so not wanting to take any unnecessary risks, Fa Ziying rented a room for himself in a small guesthouse. 
However, the couple wanted to find a room they could rent in order to carry out their next crimes. Lao Rongju was already looking for targets in the KTV and they would need a better location and larger room than where Fa Ziying was staying. One of the women Lao Rongju was working with in the KTV started talking about wanting to rent out an apartment she owned close to where Fa Ziying was living. The woman who was known by the name Ge Ge was looking to move to a newer home and wanted to sublet the room to earn some extra income. Lao Rongju had already noticed that her colleagues seemed to have some money. Ge Ge often wore expensive clothes and jewelry and had her own cell phone which was very rare at that time in China. She had a boyfriend from Taiwan who often sent her money. When Lao Rongju informed Fa Ziying of the situation, he formed a plan instantly. Over the next few days Lao Rongju borrowed money from some of her other colleagues to pay the deposit on the apartment of Ge Ge. Fa Ziying accompanied both of them to look at the room before moving in. Once inside Fa Ziying's track, as he did to Bao Xiong, he put a knife to the throat of Ge Ge. He told her if she moved, he would kill her. Frightened and shocked, Ge Ge froze up. Lao Rongju tied her colleague up before Fa Ziying carried her to the bedroom. He asked where she was hiding the money. Frozen, Ge Ge was unable to speak no matter what threats Fa Ziying made towards her. Frustrated, Fa Ziying and Lao Rongju turned the apartment upside down looking for anything of any value. However, Ge Ge did not keep much cash in the apartment. Determined to get something from the robbery, the two asked Ge Ge to call her boyfriend and tell him to come over. Now able to speak, she told them he wouldn't have much to give them, but she could call her friend, referred to as Sha Sha. Sha Sha was her manager at the KTV bar, and Ge Ge assured Fa Ziying and Lao Rongju that she had money. Ge Ge called Sha Sha and told her she was sick and needed someone to go to hospital with her. Sha Sha was woken by the call. She agreed to help, but rather than go herself, she sent another woman, referred to as Xiao Lu, to help Ge Ge. As Fa Ziying hit, Lao Rongju opened the door to Xiao Lu and let her into the bedroom where Ge Ge was lying under a quilt to hide the fact she was tied up. On seeing it was Xiao Lu and not Sha Sha, Ge Ge, surprised the wrong person had come, said she didn't know Xiao Lu well and wouldn't go anywhere with her. She would only go with Sha Sha. Xiao Lu, not being any use left, thinking nothing of the situation. Eventually, Sha Sha came to the apartment and had the knife of Fa Ziying at her throat as soon as the door closed behind her. Again, Lao Rongju tied the captive up and Sha Sha joined Ge Ge in the bedroom. They went through the handbag of Sha Sha, finding little money in sight. But she did have her bank passbook. Fa Ziying forced Sha Sha to give up her password and Lao Rongju went to the bank to withdraw the money, while Fa Ziying watched over the hostages. At the bank staff would question why Lao Rongju was removing money from another person's account, but since she had the passbook and ID card of Sha Sha the bank staff didn't press too hard. Lao Rongju was able to withdraw close to 30,000 RMB in cash. Once she had finished she contacted Fa Ziying to tell him the trip was a success before returning to the hotel to pack her things. Before she left she placed some wet clothes out on the balcony to dry. This was to give people the impression someone was still occupying the room. After receiving the call from Lao Rongju, Fa Ziying decided he didn't want to leave any witnesses. He strangled both women. He then caught up with Lao Rongju at a predetermined meeting point. The couple would get on a bus and leave Wenzhou. Once again the pair would spend time traveling around the country. They first went to Guangzhou in Guangdong province. They would stay there for some time living off the money they had stolen in Wenzhou. Then they headed to Chongqing. Chongqing was once considered a part of Sichuan province, but in 1983 several counties were merged into the municipality. This made Chongqing the city with provincial level management and today Chongqing is seen as being a province in of itself. The two would feel very comfortable in Chongqing and decided that this would be the place they call home from now on. They agreed that they shouldn't commit any crimes here and that if one day one of them was caught this would be where one would wait for the other. However, Living without a regular income would see them getting low on funds again. So almost a year since they left Wenzhou they began making plans for their next crime. Lao Rongju remembered a man she met during their time in Nanchang. The man will be referred to as Bo Xiu. Bo Xiu was in Nanchang on a business trip and met Lao Rongju in the nightclub she was working in at that time. She remembered Bo Xiu seemed to enjoy her company a lot and that the man ran a very successful business. She still had his contact details and began making a number of calls to Boss Liu in the hope he would be interested in seeing her again. Boss Liu was flattered Lao Rongju, who he still believed was Chen Jia from Sichuan, wanted to see him again and still thought about him two years later. They agreed to meet. 
Lao Rongzhi would come to him in Changzhou City in Jiangxi. In September of 1998, Lao Rongzhi and Fa Ziying followed their usual pattern. Lao Rongzhi took a job in a dance hall, and they rented a room close to it with stolen ID cards. The plan was for Lao Rongzhi to meet Boss Liu and bring him back to the apartment. If she couldn't convince him, she was going to pick out another target. Lao Rongzhi didn't have to wait for the dance hall to open. Boss Liu came to meet her as soon as he knew she was free. She took him to the apartment. This time, Fa Ziying didn't just put the knife to the victim's throat. He stabbed Boss Liu in the chest as soon as the door was closed. Screaming in pain and now lying on the floor, Boss Liu was tied up as the couple searched him for cash and anything else of value. But there was little for Lao Rongzhi and Fa Ziying to take. Lao Rongzhi mentioned the expensive red sports car Boss Liu had driven to meet her. Fa Ziying handed his knife to Lao Rongzhi so she could watch over Boss Liu while he went to search the car. In that neighborhood, the car stood out and would easily attract attention. Fa Ziying drove it to a different area of the city. While alone in the room with Boss Liu, Lao Rongzhi made it very clear what she would do if he tried to get away. In the car, Boss Liu had left a bag and wallet. Fa Ziying took them both with him as he took a taxi back to the apartment. However, the amount of money in the bag and wallet wasn't enough to satisfy Lao Rongzhi or Fa Ziying. Fa Ziying ordered Boss Liu to call his wife and tell her to bring them some money for his release. Boss Liu replied that he didn't keep cash at home and his wife wouldn't be able to get any money out of the bank until the next day. Fa Ziying and Lao Rongzhi were prepared to wait. Boss Liu made the call to his wife, making it very clear how serious the situation was. He told her to take their life savings out and bring it to him. Fa Ziying cut in on the call and warned her if the police were informed she would never see her husband again. The wife of Boss Liu spent the morning getting together as much money as she could. She managed to withdraw seventy thousand RMB, around ten thousand U.S. dollars. She contacted her husband. Fa Ziying tried to arrange a place for him to meet her and take the money. She would bravely refuse, saying she would only hand the money over once she had seen her husband. Fa Ziying told Lao Rongzhi to go and meet the woman to bring her back. Lao Rongzhi suggested that if she didn't return in two hours. Fa Ziying should end the life of Boss Liu and go on the run. Lao Rongzhi successfully met with the wife of Boss Liu. The two would take a taxi back. Lao Rongzhi gave the driver directions, which would have them circling around the city in the hope of hiding the location of the apartment they were renting. Once at the apartment, the woman was tied up and the money taken. Fa Ziying told Lao Rongzhi to leave with the spoils and wait for him at their pre-planned meeting spot. Fa Ziying placed a bag over the head of Boss Liu and approached him with a knife. The wife of Boss Liu saw a change in the eyes of Fa Ziying and knew what he was planning on doing. The wife of Boss Liu had been gagged, but she stared at Fa Ziying, shaking her head furiously, begging him not to do it. Somehow she got through to Fa Ziying, who squatted down in front of Boss Liu and told him, "Always remember, your wife has given you your life." Fa Ziying then left to meet up with Lao Rongzhi, and the couple left Jiangsu. Boss Liu and his wife would manage to break free. They wouldn't go to the police after. The seventy thousand they had stolen was only a year's salary for them, and since they were both alive, they treated it as losing money to learn a lesson. Fa Ziying and Lao Rongzhi spent the next year traveling around China, but once again the money would begin to run out since they didn't work and spent lavishly as they traveled. At some point, they arrived in Hangzhou City in Zhejiang Province. They spent around a month in the city as their money dwindled away. As they were at the bus station choosing their next destination, they saw a bus heading to Hefei City. By now, the pair were traveling under the names Ye Weiqiang for Fa Ziying and Shen Lingqiu for Lao Rongzhi. They would each rent a room in different hotels due to them still not having a marriage certificate. They spent a few days exploring the city and formed the impression that there were a number of people who looked like they were doing well financially. They decided that it was a good location to find their next target to rob, so they could continue their lifestyle. They started looking for a room to rent and a dance hall for Lao Rongzhi to find their next victim. As Lao Rongzhi went to work at the dance hall, Fa Ziying was preparing the room for the job. After thinking about having to leave Lao Rongzhi watching over Boss Liu, he decided to buy a dog cage. When Lao Rongzhi came home and saw it, she asked what it was for. Fa Ziying told her, "This is to shut our monkey down." It didn't take long for Lao Rongzhi find her man. It was Boss Yi. Boss Yin had made money in Shenzhen and returned to Hefei to run his own company. Lao Rongzhi didn't have to work hard to get the attention of Boss Yin. He was quite taken by her, and once she invited him back to her home, 
he was more than happy to take up the invitation. Like the others before him, Bao Xiying had a knife put to his throat and was tied up before being stuck into the dog cage. And like some of the other victims, he didn't bring much of value with him to the apartment. Fa Ziying once again asked his hostage to call his wife to bring them some money, but Bao Ziying was made of stern stuff. He refused, not taking Fa Ziying seriously, and demanded to be released. He told Fa Ziying he wouldn't go to the police, but he wasn't going to give them any money. Fa Ziying realized he was going to have to take a drastic action to make Bao Ziying more compliant. First, Fa Ziying thought about getting the building landlord to come to the room, but he was unable to get hold of him. So he left Bao Ziying in the room with Lao Rongzhi watching over him while he went out to find someone who would come to the apartment. At this time in China, and to some extent today, it was common for skilled workers and laborers to hang around on the streets waiting for someone to offer them work. Fa Ziying came upon a carpenter, referred to as Xiao Lu. He told Xiao Lu he needed some work doing in his home, and thinking it was a paying job Xiao Lu was happy to go along. This changed when he walked inside and saw Boss Yin locked in the dog cage. Xiao Lu tried to get back to the door but his way was blocked by a knife wielding Fa Ziying. Xiao Lu quickly moved to the room's balcony, but the room was too high up for him to take the chance of jumping. He instead chose to fight. Fa Ziying got the better of the carpenter physically then stabbed him 16 times. He then cut the head off the man and held it up to show Boss Yin he wasn't playing around. A now terrified Boss Yin knew there was only one way he was going to get out of this situation alive. He offered to give them 200,000 RMB. When Fa Ziying just stared back in silence, Boss Yin raised the offer to 300,000. Fa Ziying ordered Boss Yin to call his wife to get the money together. Boss Yin told his wife what had happened in the room and that he needed her to get the 300,000 within three days. Listening to the call, Fa Ziying interrupted to tell the woman he wanted the money today and he would come to meet her in 20 minutes. Before he left he got Bao Ziying to write a letter to his wife, making sure she understood the situation fully. As Fa Ziying waited no one turned up to hand him the money. He returned to the apartment to tell Bao Ziying his wife had let him down. Bao Ziying called her again to find out what happened. It turned out the two just missed each other. Knowing the amount of money he was going to get, Fa Ziying arranged for them to meet the next day. Finally the two met and they went to the apartment of Bao Xiying. His wife had only managed to get 100,000 RMB. Fa Ziying demanded the rest but was told the family didn't have that much here. The woman told him she would need to go back to her hometown to get the rest or ask some friends. Perhaps his mind being clouded by the possibility of getting such a large sum of money, Fa Ziying allowed the woman to leave the apartment by herself to go and borrow the money from a colleague of hers. The friend she went to for the money was immediately concerned why the wife of Bao Xiying needed so much money so quickly. She got the full story and told her to call the police. The wife of Bao Xiying took the chance and made the call. This call finally ended the criminal career of Fa Ziying. After his arrest police interrogated Fa Ziying, trying to put a timeline together of his crimes. Fa Ziying bore all responsibility and would refuse to admit that Lao Rongzhi played any part in what happened. Since the case had made national news, the arrest of Fa Ziying being broadcast on television, Boss Liu and his wife came forward with their story. The fingerprints found at the home of Gogo were also linked to him. With his leg not healed from the gunshot he received from the police during his arrest, officers helped carry Fa Ziying into court to face his trial. Judges and his own lawyer were shocked by the complete lack of remorse shown for any of the victims. The only time he displayed anything close to contrition was in the case of the three-year-old daughter of Bo Xiong, casually declaring he considered that a real crime. He maintained that Lao Rongzhi played no part in what happened, despite testimony from the surviving witnesses and forensic evidence from the scene of Bo Xin and the carpenter Xiao Lu. On the same day as his trial the judges had no hesitation in sentencing Fa Ziying to death. One month later after refusing to appeal the sentence, Fa Ziying was publicly executed. But for the police and families of the victims there was still no closure. There wouldn't be until they could get an answer to the question, where was Lao Rongzhi? The police would spend seven months intensively trying to find an answer to that question. They often visited her family in Jiujiang hoping she would return to them now she had been separated from Fa Ziying. The family would always say they hadn't seen or heard from her. Slowly, any leads or clues the police had dried up or came to nothing. Lao Rongzhi had vanished. Reluctantly, the police had to stop spending so much money and time looking for her. But she wouldn't be forgotten. Where exactly she went after the arrest of Fa Ziying was never truly cleared up. 
There is little confirmed information on what she did and where she stayed for a number of years. Her life with Fa Zin had taught her how to take on other identities so she knew how to hide. What is known is that at some time around 2016 she arrived in Xiamen City in Fujian province on the south coast of China. Being a coastal city Xiamen is renowned for its seafood and is a popular shooting location for a number of television productions. People who knew her at this time said she had a quiet, gentle personality and had no idea who she was or what she had done in her past. Lao Rongzhi only identified herself to people as Xue Li, or using the English name, Sherry. She found work as a hostess in the True Love Bar in the city, going back to a profession she had plenty of past experience of doing. She also worked in a car dealership and at a counter selling watches in a department store. In the True Love Bar she would sit and drink with male customers getting commission for the drinks she got her companions to buy. Despite being older than most of the other women working in the bar she was a popular hostess. The manager of the bar said she would generally attract men in their 40s and she looked younger than her age and had a good manner with customers. The manager said she was a hard worker, always looking to initiate conversations with customers and promote the drinks. Lao Rongzhi only worked in the bar for a year. She gave no reason why she was quitting but people would see on her social media that she seemed to be selling watches full time. In the morning of November 28, 2019, Lao Rongzhi was arrested at the watch counter of Dongbai Cai Tang Shopping Mall. She remained completely calm as police identified themselves and took her away to the police station. Once there she was asked outright if she was Lao Rongzhi, she repeatedly denied this giving investigators another name and claiming to be from Nanjing. Investigators extracted samples from her for DNA comparison. They would be a match, confirming they had indeed found Lao Rongzhi. The woman wanted for her part in several violent robberies and who had been hiding for 20 years. Once faced with results of the DNA test, Lao Rongzhi couldn't hide anymore and finally admitted who she was. When news of her arrest spread and her true identity was known, her circle of friends were shocked and found it hard to believe this gentle, kind, charming woman could have anything to do with a series of such shocking crimes. The general public were curious as to how a fugitive who had been on the run for so long was finally tracked down after so many years. Once the identity of Lao Rongzhi had been confirmed, the police held a press conference to explain how she was found. On June 13, 2019, the Ministry of Public Security announced a new operation under the name Yunjian Xingdong or Cloud Sword. The aim of the operation was to crack down on the rising amount of telecommunication fraud and to look for fugitives using new technology available to the police. Part of this was to use recent advances in facial recognition technology to find people suspected of crimes in the past and bringing them to justice. In Xiamen alone the police had quite a bit of success, tracking down a number of fugitives the police had been searching for and would get convictions for several cold cases. Due to her being a wanted fugitive the police had scans of images on Lao Rongzhi on their files. And despite her having plastic surgery on her face at some point in the years she was wanted, the system would still pay and identify her to police as she walked through the shopping mall at which she was working. After a delay caused by the lockdowns happening across China and the rest of the world at that time, the trial was delayed until the following year. So on December 21, 2020, Lao Rongzhi would face trial for intentional homicide, robbery, and kidnapping. Lao Rongzhi had confessed to ensnaring the men, but she claimed she played no part in the deaths of any of the victims. This echoed what Fa Ying told police back when he confessed 20 years prior. While it would have been difficult to prove that she had involvement in the deaths of most of the victims, Boss Ying remained in question. Fa Ying only confessed to killing Boss Ying once he knew the police hadn't arrested Lao Rongzhi. He had originally told them that Boss Ying was alive when he left the apartment on the day of his arrest. However, the forensic evidence suggested that Boss Ying dies after the arrest of Fa Ying. When considering the death penalty for Lao Rongzhi, the court had to decide if she knew what Fa Ziying was planning to do. There was little doubt that she had brought the victims to the attention of Fa Ziying, but her role after that was harder to prove. Her defense argued that she couldn't have known if Fa Ziying intended to kill the victims. They used the spur of the moment killing of Bao Xiong and the fact Fa Ziying didn't kill Bao Liu or his wife as evidence that Fa Ziying was unpredictable. Therefore, Lao Rongzhi couldn't have known if he intended to kill the victims. However, in the case of Boss Ying, the prosecution argued that Fa Ziying telling Lao Rongzhi to go out and buy a second-hand freezer meant she knew Fa Ziying intended to kill. There was no other reason for Fa Ziying to want the freezer except to store a body. 
the court decided the prosecution had shown sufficient evidence and sentenced Lao Rongzhi to death. Yet this still would not be the end of this case. Lao Rongzhi would appeal and face a second trial. Thanks to one of the brothers of Lao Rongzhi, her family would get a new legal team appointed for the second trial. In the hopes of getting her a lighter sentence, the new legal team would argue that the original punishment was excessive and question the legality of the verdict. The first point the defense brought up was the confession Lao Rongzhi had given after she was arrested. Although she retracted it before the first trial, they claimed that investigators had used illegal means to extract it and it should therefore be discounted. In the case in Changzhou, where boss Liu and his wife were left alive, the defense argued that the witness testimony they gave should be discounted because they were pressured into giving evidence. But again the case of boss Yin was difficult to overcome. While there was no definitive proof Lao Rongzhi committed the crime, her actions and behavior while holding Boss Yin captive was evidence that she was fully aware of the possibility and did nothing to prevent it. Each point the defense made would be countered by the prosecution and the death sentence Lao Rongzhi was facing was upheld. In January of this year the case was selected to be looked into by the Supreme Court of China. The focus is not on the guilt or innocence of Lao Rongzhi, but on how severe the punishment should be and if the death penalty is too harsh a sentence. In March of this year the legal representatives of Lao Rongzhi submitted their final evidence and as of making this video there has been no decision made public. One of the major points of contention is the issue of coercion. Did Lao Rongzhi take part in these crimes of her own free will or was she forced into it by Fa Xin? In first trial a number of people who knew the couple before their crime spree would give evidence on the relationship. Some would say that Lao Rongzhi had talked about Fa Xin being an abusive boyfriend. Others said they never heard or saw any evidence of this. Then there is the fact that after the crime scenes in Changzhou and the last one in Hefei, Lao Rongzhi was left alone with the victims and could have left or contacted the police. In the Wenzhou crime Fa Ziying allowed her to leave the scene first and go to a bus station but she made no attempt to get away. Was this by choice of from fear? Fa Ziying was clearly a very violent dangerous man who thought nothing of decapitating someone just to make a point. The there is the fact that in the 20 years after the events in Hefei, Lao Rongzhi vanished. It is unknown what she did during this time until she came to Xiamen, if she had any contact with her family. How she made money to survive. But there hasn't been any other major crimes linked to her. To many she is already a violent serial killer, to others a criminal but one that got dragged into it by an extremely dangerous psychopath she met when she was still young and naive. It only remains to be seen how the Supreme Court views it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video please consider like, subscribing, and commenting. And we hope to see you again for the next one.